that this version was available even on Windows. And later on, last night when I saw your communication, I realized that this is exclusively for uh, the MacBook or the Apple users. However, there are certain, um, I would say, um, scholars who use iPhones and yep. MacBooks. So this would be a wonderful thing for us. Okay. I think and universities, I'm hoping, yeah, I'm so sorry. Please. I, I'm just hoping that I'm going to focus more on like how software reflects a workflow with uh, mm -hmm. like my creating TAMS was part of me solving problems and a certain workflow in qualitative research. Okay. And that that's true of any application and, and try oh, to get okay. to that a little. Right. That's wonderful. And in a university, uh, especially in my university, you know, we have the access to, um, I would say, Mac desktops only, MacBooks, you know, the yeah. larger one, you know. So that's the reason why I was more interested that, okay, at home, uh, maybe we might look from iPhones or um, maybe, um, you know, uh, just look as how you are uh, going to give us the, uh, you know, introduction to it. And later on, once we move to our universities and wherever uh, the scholars or myself, we get the access, we will definitely use them. Oh, lovely. So that was something which I really wanted to. So, you know, this, when I read, um, you know, first of all, you are going to give us the introduction to the software also. And then, um, you know, looking at one punchline that I saw is that TAMS analyzer works very well with, I think, ethnographic research. Yeah. It, and also a content analysis. Oh, okay. That's wonderful. Okay. I pro it's probably, well, I'll talk about it, but it's, it's weak point is something like ethnomethodology. Oh. It, it, it really, when you're doing that kind of fine tune, this person, you know, breathed here and said this and they overlapped their words by these three seconds, that kind of very close reading of interaction, it's probably less um, equipped to deal with. So I think another four minutes and then we will start off with the session because I told them to join me up by um, eight o'clock. So eight okay. Indian time. So we will be starting off. And uh, in the meantime, uh, let me go ahead and, uh, you know, get prepared to introduce you also in a couple of minutes to the entire gathering. Okay. I'll just okay. take a couple of minutes and I'll be joining back again. All right. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, good morning, Matthew. Once good again. Morning. But now officially, I have to introduce you to the entire gathering. Uh, good evening to all the participants of the workshop, also uh, titled as Introduction to Qualitative Research. Now, uh, in this particular master class, um, I should say he is indeed a master and a very down to earth kind of a person. Uh, he is none other than Dr. Matthew Wenstein. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Okay. Now, he is a professor of science education at the University of Washington, Tacoma. He is the author of two books. You know, and that are Robo World, Education, Popular Culture, and Science and Bodies Out of Control, co-authored with Liga Maki. His research interest includes ethics and science education, which is a very rare combination. And looking at your first book, uh, that is Robo World, um, I can understand what ethical things you are talking about, uh, Dr. Matthew the political economy of human subjects and looking at the way of free sources like R, Python, artificial intelligence, which is almost, uh, I should say, um, covered, um, I would say, um, important areas of our life now. I see that the work that he is doing is very appropriate, the political economy of human subjects. Um, and science education policy also. Now, he is the creator of TAMS Analyzer, and that's why I'm going to clap for him, that I have the person with me who is uh, going to tell us everything about the software in and out, and he's the best person. Um, TAMS Analyzer is an open source qualitative research program for Mac operating systems. Previously, it was um, you know mentioned by him as um, operating systems X. So does that mean, I have a first question for Dr. Matthew here. Uh, does that mean that uh, there is no future for Windows uh, for terms and analyzer if you are focusing only on Mike? Now that's the question and I think you can start off your session. <laughs> as your so, so here's the challenge. So. Um, TAMS Analyzer is really written in kind of the native language, the native operating system of the Mac. Uh, but Mac is based on an older operating system, which if you are really old like me, you may have heard of called the Next Computer. The Next Computer, uh, Stephen Jobs actually left Apple for a while and worked in a different company called Next. And when he came back to Apple, he brought the Next operating system with it. Now, there's a group of programmers that have created an open source version of the next operating system called New Step. And there is a version of TAMS, an old, old version of TAMS for New Step, but I'd love to like bring that one up to date. And if that could be brought up to date, then basically TAMS could run on what's called the Linux subsystem of um, Windows. So, it would kind of pile on top of the Windows world. But that's kind of its only route to get to Windows at this point. But it is a dream of mine. Oh, wow. So I <laughs> so, think we should get it as nope, soon as nope, possible. Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> we are yeah. all looking forward for it, Matthew. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward for today's session also from you. As I said, it's a master series. And I have the master here for Tams Analyzer on yours now. Thank you, Matthew, right. for joining us up. I was explaining that I am not a master of um, Google Meetings. Is that what we're in? Okay. I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yes. You have zoomed okay. in, so it's perfectly fine for us, yes. Okay, because uh, I can't see you all now. So that's the challenge here. Um, all right, so I should say that I know most of you probably don't use Apple operating system. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that 
in telling the story of TAMS, it will have sort of a narrative appeal even beyond uh, just knowing the tool. But I am going to walk through the tool a little bit. I'll actually demonstrate it kind of live in a bit, but I kind of put together a slideshow partially for readability and partially so I could like point to things on the screen. And TAM stands for Text Analysis Markup System. But just to be clear, this system has really evolved. I mean, it was created in the fall of 2001, which you will see is significant. And now it can uh, deal with images, video, and PDFs as well. And I just should say, I can't see you all. I'm just seeing my slide here. And as a, as a result, uh, unmic and ask questions, and I'll try to be quiet and listen for such questions as we go. Matthew, I would like to uh, suggest, make a suggestion. Uh, yeah. We will go ahead with the, your presentation for an hour, if you say, and then, uh, you know, I would request all the participants to, um, you know, come up with their queries in the chat box. And after one hour, you know, after taking five minutes of break with you, we will start off with the question so you can answer one. Lovely. If you think that's a, a good idea. That works just fine for me. But thank you. So we will go according to this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Matthew. All right. So my plan is to give you a little bit of history, kind of a guided tour. And if time permits, uh, we will... I'll do a little demonstration of the software live and the sort of things you can do with it. So here's the little bit of history. I got my, t I, I'm in the, a school of education. I got my teaching certificate from Stanford where I studied philosophy of science with a woman named Nell Noddings, who's most famous because she wrote a book called Caring, which really kind of developed a philosophy of caring um, in education. After teaching for about five years I, in San Francisco Unified School District, I then uh, went to Wisconsin where I studied um, with a gentleman named Michael Apple. And he's kind of a significant person in that he was really one of the first people to bring the thinking of Antonio Gramsci and neo-Marxist thinking to educational issues. I got my minor in anthropology and media studies. So that's kind of my um, credentialing sort of in this qualitative research field. I was very interested in the field of science and technology studies. Um, and I was a very active member in the early days of a group called CASTAC, which is part of the American Anthropological Association. It's the group that studies anthropologically science, technology, and computing. So that's kind of my background, just in terms of sort of degrees and interests. So um, uh, it was mentioned that my first book, was uh, Robot World, and that was really my dissertation turned into a book. And I did use computers in 1995 to try to manage um, the project, which involved both ethnographic field work as well as ethnographic interviews and some media analysis. And at the time I used kind of a sequence of programs and, and these are programs almost lost to time these days but nicest which was a very powerful programmable word processor panorama which was a simple database with a lot of tricks for organizing data and a, a program called an outliner uh, it was called more um, it was really the first of its kind. If you know the outlining feature in Microsoft Word, it is that times 10. I mean, it is really a brilliant program uh, lost to uh, the transition to more modern operating systems. And so I would move data between these things um, to code in Nysys and then analyze using some combination of Panorama and more. In two, by 2000, I was in my first position and um, I was very much working on uh, textbook analysis and um, 
particularly interested, for example, in how textbooks treat uh, subjects of disease and illness. And uh, at the same time as I was doing ethnographic studies of activist human research subjects, um, uh, people who uh, try to organize human subjects um, for their ethical as well as financial uh, and health care. Um, and the, my workflow with that was very similar. It was kind of juggling these different programs to do different things. Um, Apple has a database under the name Claris as a company uh, called FileMaker, which I frequently used. But then 9-11 happened, and I was in Ohio at that point, working at Kent State University. Um, and I was really struck by sort of uh, the neo-nationalism that was arising after the attacks. And in particular, I was interested in the anthrax attacks because uh, it was very clear that the Bush administration wanted to attack Iraq. But Iraq didn't attack the United States. So there needed to be some um, justification for the attack. And the anthrax attacks provided this perfect opportunity for them. And I felt using kind of the skills I had picked up and the theory I had picked up in the science technology studies world, um, that by looking at media, I could actually watch in real time starting just like a week after the first anthrax attacks, um, uh, categorize uh, discourses in news in two different cities, one closer to the attacks, one farther from the attacks, the attacks being Washington DC and New York City, kind of being the sites of them, and, and study how nationalist ideas were materially manufactured in these two sites. And that's where TAMS came in. It was originally designed to look at newspapers. And I guess one of my theses in this little presentation is that all of these qualitative software programs, HyperQual or in, um, in vivo, which used to be called Nudist back in the 1990s, but the time I was working at TAMS, on TAMS, um, they represent people's workflows with qualitative data. So my workflow involved uh, downloading articles from these two newspapers uh, at different removes from ground zero of the anthrax attacks and track the discourses used. And all of this was published in the book that Nita and I uh, wrote. Nita was my graduate student at the time, Bodies Out of Control, Rethinking Science Texts. So um, originally it was just a system for marking themes in their context in a text file. And what it looks like is this, you've got a text file and you just surround the text with some code that you want to attribute to that text. Um, it could be hierarchical, so I could have a code and a subcode, and this is how I developed um, a representation of that. And because Nita and I were both working on this, we came up with this system for indicating who had coded what in the text. Uh, and eventually a way of adding uh, comments or memos to particular um, slices of text. So, um, so just keep in mind, that's kind of what it looks like. And you'll see that my source documents t do tend to get kind of ugly fairly quickly as a result of that. So in, TAM, in the Anthrax project, you, uh, we had huge numbers of codes. And I'll, I'll give you the counts in a while. Um, so uh, one of the big emergent themes was fear. And um, my favorite code here, as you'll see, is one called Fear Calm, which is when they're trying to calm you down, but everything they say makes you more anxious. Um, so that was, uh, that, that 
occurs uh, in various documents. But this is just like the whole fear family of codes used very much, um, um, these are not a, pri a priori codes, these are codes that um, developed as we worked through the document coding and recoding things. And TAMs can generate with the help of a, a sort of auxiliary program called GraphViz, um, sort of image, these tree images uh, like this one there to represent that code family. And what the numbers, I don't, I don't know how legible those numbers are to you, but um, those numbers represent uh, how many actual times those codes got applied to some text or other. And this is across both cities that you're seeing there. So you can see that fear about the attack happened about 159 instances. That could be many times in an article. Uh, next one was uh, fear of cross-contamination there. Um, and moving down, we have fear of, of powder because people started seeing powder everywhere. If there was some talcum or chalk dust, people thought it was anthrax. So all of this got coded uh, here. The other um, big interest that came out of um, this project was an interest in how science and biology itself got handled. Um, uh, I really did look at the anthrax news as a public pedagogy around science. Uh, and what it means. And we've seen, certainly seen a similar pedagogy develop around COVID. And like the COVID pedagogy, it's a pedagogy that invites uncertainty because the scientists are just figuring it out in real time. And so they'll reverse themselves day to day. And the same was very much true in the anthrax. So um, uh, as things got uncovered, as claims were made, as understandings sort of evolved, because it was happening not in the privacy of the lab, but in the news, um, science actually looks terrible. Like it, it looks like this thing that you cannot trust at all when it, it has that kind of public face. So in that uh, project, uh, we had 125 codes and subcodes. 917 articles got coded. And in those 917, uh, Nita and I coded 18, 1,847 passages. So, so that's kind of, this was kind of the um, crucible which TAMS developed it, uh, this kind of intense and uh, this intense sort of qualitative live research. But TAMS didn't just pop up as an application overnight. It itself had a genesis that was related to those earlier processes I had used. The first version of TAMS was actually a command line and you can still get it. And I know a lot of Linux users who actually still prefer the command line version and then they kind of figure out how to do the coding and analysis themselves. And what the, cat, the command line version does is it takes those codes that I showed you, that system, and it generates it into a, a spreadsheet. It's actually a tab separated file, which can be read by a spreadsheet or any database software, as well as a concordance of where the codes are. Um, and you can certainly still download that command line uh, version of the software and probably run it under Windows if you like. But it's really leaving you to figure out how to get those codes into the document and how to analyze it afterwards. There is this, like I said, this older version of TAMS, I think it was TAMS 2 and we're on TAMS 4 now. Uh, it, it's missing a lot of the reporting features, unfortunately. And Linux is not great at supporting audiovisual or PDF files in particular. There's no, the, the standards aren't there. So it, there's like eight or nine different libraries. And so it becomes very complicated um, under Linux and NewStep 
to um, count on anyone's computer having all the things they need to work with these multifarious um, formats and and file types, etc. Uh, and it's one of the the reasons why this is a very sort of pared down version. And then for OS X, or now they're just calling it uh, Apple OS or something or other, there's a single user version where you control the data all on your machine. And then there's a multi-user version where you have to get someone to host or house a MySQL database. And then everyone points their version of TAMS at it and you can exchange files. It has a kind of a library checkout system so that if you want to be the person coding file three, you check it out if, you know, if it's available and um, uh, then only you can make changes on that file. Um, your analyses are local. It's just the data that is shared in this database. So those are kind of the versions of, um, of TAMs that are out there. I am gonna to have to do, this is embarrassing. I hear my cat at the door outside and I'm gonna run over and let him in. So back in one second. Everyone meet Benny, and you can say hi to Benny, and then he will run off. All right. Hi, Benny. <laughs> oh, I love animals. <laughs> yes, that's very good. Thank you for introducing Danny also. Very good. All right. Well, hopefully he will let me actually give this presentation to you all. Um, <laughs> so uh, the next step actually in TAMS was, uh, of course I opened the door and he doesn't go anywhere, uh, a text editor that allowed me to create a code book for the project and apply TAMS through a very simple GUI where I could just select the text, double click the code from a list and not worry about typing anything. Um, for existing codes at least. And so this was initially its own um, application, TAMS Edit. And final piece was creating a database. Um, like I said, there was this amazing textual database called Panorama with incredible organizational tunes that let you collapse columns and expand them. The other thing I found that I needed for the Anthrax project was uh, pivot tables. And um, so I created a, an application called Data Boiler that I've recently kind of revived from the dead, um, which uh, basically had Excel's pivot table capability. I, the, what they're called in TAMS is data comparison tables, and I'll show you a few of them in a moment. And TAMS Analyzer, was like one mega program that combined pretty much all of those phases as well as file management. So here's everything that TAMS helps people with with their research project. It has a little transcription machine in the coding window and it works like an old fashioned transcription machine. That is when you pause it, which you can do on the keyboard or with menus or with buttons, it will backspace a few seconds so that you can rehear that passage and really make sure that you're transcribing correctly. It also allows you to like insert time codes straight into the transcript. And it's the transcript that gets analyzed because at least initially TAMS was focused on text. Coding, um, uh, analysis, you can see kind of a spreadsheet like thing in the background there. And then using that spreadsheet, you can apply codes back to your source documents in a process called recoding and reanalysis, and then finally reporting out. To get it, here is the um, URL for uh, getting the latest version. Um, and I say I've been 
cranking up out at least two versions a month, roughly, for the last couple of years. There were about three years where I just could not bear to work on it. Um, so much of the Apple operating system had changed. It needed such massive um, reviving that I needed to get a sabbatical to actually redo do it. And the fall of, not last fall, but a fall earlier, I was able to get that time off and to bring it back from the dead. Just so you know, if you download TAMS, Apple tries to babysit you and not let you open things that you just happen to download on uh, websites. So they have a trick uh, to uh, the first time you run a software that you download this way. Uh, you have to hold down the control key, click on the application icon, and you get this little pop-up menu, and you pick open. And then it asks you a couple more times, like, are you sure you want to open this? You know, this came from the World Wide Web. Probably don't want to open that. Um, if you just keep on saying, yes, I want to open it, it will let you open it. And what you get when you um, open it is a project manager. So this is what um, where you kind of have to launch things from. Um, and you can add and subtract things um, to the list of projects there. And you have to create projects through this interface. Um, you can see on the bottom the new project panel there. Because TAMS has to micromanage everything. It creates a whole database a, a folder structure to put all the pieces it needs to track. And when you double click um, one of the rows there, you're going to get the project window. And the project window has to manage everything. It has to keep your code straight. It has to communicate those codes to the code editing window, to the analysis window. Um, you have to kind of do everything through this project window so that um, it can watch everything you're doing locally. Um, it, it's not spying on you. It's just trying to keep the, the things you want together together. Um, so this is kind of, this is the project window. And the project window really controls everything. Oops, I did not mean to do that. Um, Kevin, help me. Can you see this? Please let me know someone. Yes, it's visible. Okay, so you can see here, you have buttons for adding new new files. Um, uh, you have you can open files just by double clicking. You can uh, rearrange the files using uh, these buttons here, and you use this list of files to create your search list, um, which is what you're going to do for analysis as well as for a whole bunch of the reports. Um, use this search list uh, to generate the data. Uh, you can save search lists. Uh, you can also create sets of files. So if I just want, um, you know, just my male uh, research subjects, I could create a subset of j with just them. So it's very flexible in managing data in a lot of different ways. In addition, uh, this is where you create your code book. And um, the code book, uh, you can see the codes and hierarchical codes there on the left side. You can see definitions. By the way, anytime you have a list of codes here, you'll see there's a code def button up there. And uh, that you just click that to uh, find out what that code means as you uh, created it. You can assign codes different colors or just use the inherited color. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so that's how uh, this works. That's it. You can see across the top there's these tabs that I've been kind of moving through. Uh, we've looked at the files. We've looked at the defined codes. Uh, TAMS is very big on sets for analysis reasons as well as just file management reasons. You can have code sets file sets, sets of values. Um, uh, there's all sorts of ways of organizing subsets of things. So you can see here, I've created something called 4S Reasons. 4S Reasons, this is a project I'll talk about shortly, which is about why do science students 
embrace or reject using science fiction in their teaching. And so I created a set of codes here. Uh, 4S stands for Society for the Social Studies of Science. So these are reasons connected to science and society. And so we can see that people use literature for reasons of equity. Um, and that can break down to uh, issues of gender, race, learning style, and uh, reading ability, as well as ethics. And uh, NOS, which is a buzzword in science education for nature of science. So those are reasons that um, people, a subset of codes related to reasons people use science. Finally, you can use this project window to search your data. Whether the files are open or closed, it will go through and create that kind of spreadsheet of results. And you can search for particular codes. You can search for particular codes of just certain coders. Um, uh, there's ands and ors. Um, you can also uh, reduce like, you know, when you have a I have 53 codes here. That's a lot to scroll through all the time. I can kind of search the code list itself um, for particular themes or words and the like there. All right, so this is the project window. Uh, these are the types of search that can be done. The first four deal with searching for codes. The bottom four are for searching for the actual data itself. So um, I can like look for the particular word and the date and those spreadsheet, a spreadsheet will pop up with just one line for each time the word I'm searching for occurred. Or I can look for sentences that include words or paragraphs, or I can use a very complex system called regular expressions to search for patterns of letters and symbols. So like I said, uh, my, the big second project that TAMS took on was the study of what science fiction means to science teachers in training. Uh, and these were interviews of students about their beliefs around using fiction in class. And this led me to really thinking about structured and unstructured data, because in TAMS, everything was a news article. So everything had to have like the document number, the author, the title, the newspaper, and each article had to have that same information. It was very much structured data that way. In an interview, you have things like time codes that are changing throughout the document in a very different way. And so TAMS kind of evolved to deal with that. Now, when you click on a file in your lists, uh, an editor opens up and this is what the TAMS editor looks like. Um, I'll kind of walk through the parts of it here. Um, you have this media player. So uh, these were recorded interviews. I just kind of click that little plus button there and I can um, find my audio file. It's copied into that um, file structure that I talked about being created earlier. There are uh, a list of codes here at the bottom. And here you can see TAMS in all of its ugliness uh, on the right side. So you have a text editor there for the data that I typed in, but you could import it as well. You have codes, and to apply a code, I just select text and double click from the list. I also have a place where if I don't have a code yet that I want to create a code, I can type it into that box and click apply code. And um, you can see the interaction between the media player here. I actually never typed any of those time numbers there. I just click this little down arrow and it sticks in the time. And it works two ways. If I select the time and click the up arrow, this will move to that time um, so that the two are linked. You should notice that, um, uh, yeah, so there's the open and close tag. You can see the slash there that marks that. 
But I also want to point out that like there's two things I'm coding, and this is really critical here. Some things I'm coding are context, like who is speaking, what time it is, what town we're in, uh, which newspaper we're talking about. And then the actual um, substance of the analysis is the data codes, uh, which code the things that Amy, the speaker, said. Um, and TAMS has a way of declaring certain codes to be context and other code, everything that's not declared a context code is just taken as a data code. And codes can overlap, they can be nested, they can mark things as small as one letter or no letters actually, or an entire document. Uh, we're not going to get so much into PDFs, but over time I, I um, came up with a scheme to use PDFs and TAMs, um, and it works very much the same way. You have both a rectangular and a, a text selection tool, and you just select the text and double click the code on the side. It works very much the same way as with text. It has a couple of extra things. Every time you, you code something by double clicking the list, it creates a record here at the bottom. So with PDFs, the codes aren't embedded in the text. They're saved in a separate file. Um, and you can search the PDF itself so that you can code it. Um, I hope that kind of gives you a sense of how PDFs are coded as well as images are coded in a similar way. And there's actually support for video coding as well. Uh, here's an example of a rectangular selection tool. So I could code that picture as well as text um, using these two things. This is a fun little tool. Uh, this, uh, you click this button and then you select text and then only those records that intersect with the selection you make uh, appear here. So you can get subsets of the records as well. When you're done coding or done enough coding, you add your files to that search list and you click this little icon here and it generates this um, table. Uh, and you can see here that my context codes land up being columns as well as other things that TAMS uses or that you would want to know, like what code is applied. And um, you get these rows from that crazy overlap nested data before. So that's called a result window. And uh, you get the context codes turned into columns. Uh, each row is, represents one time a code has been applied to something in the text. Now that text may have five codes applied to it, in which case there are five rows for that same text. This is each row represents one use of a code applied to something. And it includes both the data that got coded as well as the code that applied to it. And we'll go into the anatomy here. Uh, there are tools for manipulating the data. There's a status bar there, which I'll get into more uh, shortly. There's a browser so that as I click on different rows, I can see the text that got coded there. Um, and then there's a panel for selecting and sorting data uh, on the right. And finally, you have the table of coded passages there. And I can see here, just so that you know, that there's 176 rows of data in this file. If I want to go see my original document, all I do is I double click a row. And that'll take me back to my original document and select uh, the appropriate data. Now, just a, a word on terminology here. I'm watching the clock a bit. Um, in TAMS, a selection, this is um, language use that comes from database theory. A selection is a subset of records in your result window. And result windows act like a database. They act like a stage where some of your rows are going to be visible, but 
all of your rows are really there. They're just off stage. So there's rows that are on stage and there's rows waiting in the wings. So to do a selection, it's very simple. I simply click a column. I fill in a value that I'm looking for in that column. And then I pick whether I want to select things, meaning get rid of everything that doesn't match biology in this case, or uh, select additional, meaning go to the rows that are off on the side and invite those that meet my criteria back onto the stage, or I can get rid of the biologies from the list and just uh, leave everything that's not, does not include the phrase biology in that column. So you have a lot of different ways of either eliminating or including things. Um, and you can do multiple selections. So uh, just to point out, this is where the status bar really comes in. You can see that I did a selection here of the biology in the code column. And of my 5,148 records, 852 of them included biology. That's what this is saying. And I will only see those 852 records below. How do I get back to all of them? Well, um, I could click, click the select all button. Um, that will bring everyone onto stage. Or I can use this. I really do think of this as like a browser um, for my data. And if I click back, I will go back one selection. And you can stack multiple selections together to really narrow down on the data you're looking for. And um, then back up and save different sub selections that you've made. Um, you can do very create complex sets and then do set operations like what's the overlap of these two sets or what's not overlapped in these two sets. Um, you can do all sorts of operations with selections of data uh, in TAMS Analyzer. And that's really what analysis is. And like I said, that kind of shows the history of selections in this current moment. And there's the arrows to getting back and forward. Yeah, and that kind of gets at what I said. So like in this example, this is from the literature, the previous uh, shot I showed you was from the anthrax. Um, this is from the literature, and you can see that I have nine records out of 176. And you can see that I've got a, a selection here of things with different codes, um, different people um, uh, put together. So these uh, collections of records, these selections, uh, can be very complex, or really arbitrary in their construction. So what sort of reports can you generate from all of this? Well, I can simply take that table of data and say, give me this column, this column, and this column of the current selection, and it will generate that. It's called a data table. So here I've got my data column, my code column, and the file name column, and just those three columns reporting out. But the real super tool is the data comparison table, the DCT, and this is the pivot table. Um, and you kind of say, what do I want across the top? What do I want down the side? What do I want in the middle? So here I wanted my file names down the side, everything in a single column, but give me the codes in that column and sub count them and give me a total on the side. And it did all of that. And it took less than a minute to like set up this and you can play with it and say, well, no, that's not exactly what I want and go back and forth. And I'll model that in a little bit. Um, here is another uh, DCT, another data comparison table, this time doing counts of codes. It's actually doing code sets. So I have four sets of codes, and I've seen how many times Amy had a stretch, a passage uh, that was coded by one of the codes in that code set uh, in the in this way. Now, I just want to say one thing before moving on, which is you'll notice that these co these numbers are in blue. That means they're actually hot linked. If I click on any of those numbers, the table will pop to the front and only those five records of Amy's 
of her, her negative reasons or Erica's four negative reasons. If I click this one, her positive reasons, only those ones will show. And I can, you know, of course, select all or go back um, uh, to see uh, the other records. But so you can use this not just to report, but also to analyze your data because you can get to, you can click any intersections or the totals and get just those records. Just showing again the flexibility of the data comparison table rather than counts uh, with a, just a couple of clicks, I was able to see the actual codes themselves that filled in in each of those code sets and the occurrences of those codes. Uh, and I can use that to also print data. So here's Amy's uh, negative reasons and her positive reasons for using um, uh, fiction in her science class. And because you'll notice, I don't know what code is applied here. I just know it was one of those codes that were in the ne negative reason set and these were codes that were from the positive reason set. So I can click more than one thing to be in each of these squares. So I've added the code so I can see what, what is the code I gave these passages of text. Mindful of time here. And again, here is a simple code count chart, all created with the same reporting mechanism. It's complex, but extremely flexible. Finally, with the help of GraphViz, which unfortunately has gotten more complicated to install over time. It used to be just a freestanding program, and now you have to kind of do a song and dance to get it installed. Um, you can generate these kind of mapping reports. Uh, here is a map of um, which of my subjects used which of my codes, and you can see um, the codes, uh, the lines, the edges, as they're called, uh, vary in thickness uh, based on how many times uh, they got used. I can graph uh, the actual families of codes here. So I have a code somewhere in there called reason equity with a subcode learning style. I can also do, like this took only a second to really generate, I can say, Okay, here's the code sets. These are not codes, these are groups of codes. Where do they overlap? So I can see that these code sets are not orthogonal, which ones are not orthogonal to other ones. Now, uh, negative reason is kind of completely non-overlapped with positive reason, that's good, because I want those two to be separate. Uh, weirdly enough, unreal and real actually have one code that they share in common here. So these two are actually not completely at um, odds with each other. So you can use that to, to analyze your coding system. I can get code counts very simply. Um, this is uh, looks at the search list. You run this report from the, the project window. I also call it the workbench. And it just broke down the codes, lists them by frequency, and you can see uh, how many times they applied in each ones. You can see it includes both context codes as well as data codes here. I can do a word count, which can be useful for seeing what keywords people are using. So I'm going to sort of stop the slideshow after this um, and kind of just pull up the program itself. Um, so, uh, uh, just some notes here. You use the result window to actually add code and recode your source documents. I will warn you, it's a slow process. It takes about two seconds for it to do all the work each time you recode. And if you have a hundred rows, you can see you better be prepared to go off for coffee. Uh, Result windows are useful for complex searching and saving of sets, which can be analysis. You're going to need graph viz, um, which can be challenging to install and you have to be an administrator or 
speak to your administrators to get it on your computer to get those nice diagrams but i do want to say that my website has tons of tutorials and videos um uh, available on it so uh there is that all right i'm going to stop my slideshow and pull up cams so here's that project window and i'm just going to open up i'm just going to you know, do that literature uh, project uh, here is um, the definition of codes there and if i wanted to get a code i can just um, scroll through there here are my files i double click one and i get this and if i want to go oh let's go to something in the middle if i want to go there i just say jump to that and you should be able to hear them that's a big one i guess all right so you get the idea there to code i would just select text and double click something tams is smart enough to check to make sure uh, like have i accidentally stuck it in the middle of a code it will not let me code there like if i do it it sticks it right in front of um that existing code i'm not going to do that all right um so uh i think i want to do that i want to redo that yeah i can delete code just by clicking somewhere in the middle of a code go to coding and delete code pair voila that is now gone um you can get the idea i think i want to take you more in my last few minutes to the analysis side of things so i'm just going to hit my search there and it has generated that table and the first thing i notice is that uh, i didn't have to type in a file name i didn't do anything but what i result get is a table that's going to be thrown out when i'm done with it. I can keep tables, I could rename this now. Um, if I just do file save as, it'll ask me for a new name and it will keep it around. Um, uh, also, when you create it, you could fill in a name and uncheck check the temporary box and it will keep it around. But you can see um, I've got my 176 passages here. Uh, I'll just do that data table just quickly to show you how that works. Let's say I want um, my data, the person speaking. Yeah, we'll just do that too. And generate, create that report. Voila, it generates that report. And I could open it. I don't have great printing. I will admit that at TAMS. But I have this button here, which will open it in your browser. And um, uh, it will then, um, easily print using whatever features your browser has. Like I said, notice it's blue. That means I can click on this and that row then gets selected back here in the result table. Not as exciting as using selections. So let's do some selections. Um, I want to, you, um, to know when they've talked about nonfiction. So I'm just gonna type nonfiction. I've clicked on the code column. I say select, okay. There were five times people talked about nonfiction. I'd like to see Erica's time here. So I just double click that, it opens up Erica's window and moves me to that spot. Um, if I want a table of this, obviously I could do the data table. I can also sort this up or sort this down by the way. But uh, let's just create a data comparison table and you can see it's a complicated interface. I pick the big thing, the pattern is simply this. I'm gonna pick what I want across, what I want down, and what I want in each cell. So across, I actually want just a single column. Oh, I have to free up the single column thing. I'll do it this way. I'm gonna do codes across, single column down, and show me the data. We'll just take the default report. You're gonna see I'm not gonna like it, but it's a playground. Oh, actually it's not bad. I need to know who's talking. That's not great. So instead 
I'm going to do a different column. I'm going to do who the file name is. Now, if I generate that report, I've got all the people and what they said. Oh, but it's across. It's kind of ugly. So I come back to my settings. I click switch access. Now it's much prettier. But I'd like to know the codes I've been using there. So I come here. I can add code. And my metaphor for this, that it's a playground for like, you kind of look at it, you're like, no, you know, I'd like a count of how many times they've coded here. So I'm going to click my include a total column and you can generate that. And if I want to see these two, I can just click there and it'll pop open the window and uh, show me those two codes that I could look at. One thing I didn't talk about is this little scrub bar. If I want to see something like extra text around this quote, I can move this over and I get extra text from the document and I can change that 25 if I want 150 characters. I can do that and then scrub down to see just the coded passage again. Um, so that's another feature. Um, it is 725. I've been babbling on for 55 minutes about this. I'm wondering, I'm going to pull up you all so I can see uh, this. Uh, thank you for posting the tutorial. Um, that came from, uh, yeah, that's Tabitha's tutorial, which is lovely. Um, uh, wondering questions, things you would like to see me demonstrate, questions you have about approaching data, talk about the kind of coding this supports versus doesn't support. What? Yes, um, sir, as far as I can see, there is one question which has come up and um, that is from the side of the um, participant. His question is, can QDA minor be similar to TAMS, number one? Number two, which can be used on Windows operating system? Or do you feel that both of them are different? I don't know. I don't use QDA minor. Okay. Um, I, this is the software I use. Um, I, I don't know what the competition is doing or not doing. Uh, I've met with Max QDA's creators a couple of times just at conferences. And, um, you know, it's, I'd say between like Max QDA and what I have, it was like a 75% overlap with interesting things that each one did different than the other. Like um, that kind of hot linking of data that I just showed was not as easy in Max QDA as it is in TAMS. But there was stuff that was easier to do with Max QDA than TAMS. So I don't wanna I don't wanna claim to be the greatest or easy it's not necessarily the easiest software to use. Okay. Now uh, so this particular software, TAMS Analyzer, is absolutely free, right? There are absolutely. no price. Free, not just uh, free to download, but free to change and modify as you see fit. Mm -hmm. The source code is completely available. Oh, okay. Now, uh, one more thing. Um, I think uh, they are looking forward for those tutorials also. And yeah. uh, some of them were trying to use them. Now, um, before anybody else can ask the questions, um, I find that uh, TAMS Analyzer, as you said, is more towards the text analysis, number one. Yeah. Um, in that way, I can also include narrative analysis also, sir. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Right. Let me I show you, let me, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to show you a, um, a recent project I okay. did. Uh, do, 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 do my entire screen. Yeah, that'll do. Um, again, let me just, did I, can you see TAMS? Oh, it's still uploading. Yes, I can okay. see now. Okay. All of yes. All right, right. So I'm going to go to, uh, yeah, don't say. I'm just going to go here. So recently I've been doing this policy study on uh, Donald Trump's um, STEM policy. I was interested in whether 
his uh, version of neo-nationalism impacted um, STEM policy in the United States or how it did. And this was a lot of PDFs. So like, here's a PDF document and PDFs are kind of tricky to work with. Um, so uh, you'll notice that it tried to get the text out of it and it failed because PDFs are not really designed for text. Um, but I can, you can see I coded things here. Um, I'm gonna do a search here, my, one of my searches. How does it deal with PDFs? Well, it can't show you the text here, but that's okay because I've got what's a little media player here. And if I just open this up on the side, uh, I can click the different rows and it will open up that PDF and show me the selection there on the side. So even when it can't figure it out straight away, it can get back to the original and show me and allow me to do all the kind of analysis and counting and so forth um, that I wanted to do. Okay. And um, are you trying to introduce uh, social network platforms also, like Facebook, Twitter, as of now, or no? Only I, I would just say no. I mean, yes, uh, you can download anything you can download to a file on your computer, you can do, but I do not access any of those social networking APIs. Okay. Now, um, next question to you is, which is better, PDF or Word file? <clears throat> For actually keeping track of the information a Word file is, because like I said, what PDFs are great at is keeping the formatting the same between computers. So if what's important to you is like the placement of the text and the pictures and everything else, mm -hmm. you need to go to PDF. But if what I'm focused on is what they're saying, then that is often not even accessible in many PDFs. Um, and so text files are richer for mining in that sense and easier to mine. Okay, right. And uh, what about image analysis? Oh, sure. Analysis? Yeah, so let me, uh, do I have an image? I think I have like uh, a fake image in, in one of my testing files. Do I have a nice image file? I've got some video here. Um, lots of video. Here's a graphic. So you can see I can select rectangles of an image and code them, uh, add a comment, add actually a data feed, like text, like I could describe each of those things, and then it would land up in the spreadsheet just the same as anything else. I don't know. Did I share my screen? Yeah, I am sharing my screen. Okay. Yes, you are. Uh, and the same goes for the audio analysis also. Yeah. So um, if you don't want to do transcription, mm -hmm. just basically audio would just be like a video. And I've got examples of a like a video. Do I have a video clip here? Yeah. So here's a video clip. Actually, I actually haven't coded anything with it, but you can move to particular times. Uh, let's uh, start a coded passage and you see these two buttons. This is where you set the beginning and end time for that passage. So it has a beginning time. It doesn't have an end time. Let me scrub here. I'll make that my end time. And you can see now I've marked that to that as that code. So um, you can do that. Now there's an... There's a little trick that TAMS has where even if you want to do with trans, like not code the video directly, you want to code the transcript of the video, mm -hmm. there's a way of setting up the TAMS editor window so that instead of having a table here with different codes, you have your transcript below, the video above rather than up here in the left-hand corner and uh, can uh, use it as a transcriber that way. So you can either code audio directly or code it through transcript with linked time codes. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what about the visualizations? Uh, uh, what I mean to say is that, uh, you know, codes and the numbers. 
Are you, is it a pure qualitative that you're focusing on uh, with the help of the TAMS analyzer? Or, uh, you know, for example, if I want to proceed further with mixed methodology? Oh, it's a great question. And I have to say, TAMS is pretty qualitative in terms of its approach. There's, um, uh, I figure uh, if you really want to do, I mean, obviously it can count things. That's the one thing it's very good at. And I th hopefully you saw that, like if I want, uh, I can do a count of words, you know, just uh, actually let's bring over everything. Uh, and I want to count words. Do, 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 do. And there is all the words that got used and which files here up on the top did. Someone wants to see the graph is now I have installed graph is now, like I said, installing graph is, is its own song and dance, but once installed, if I want to do the code, for, oh, let's do a real project, not the fake project. Oh, who's open? No. Oh. I have other things open. All right. I'm going to quit tan. That's, that's who it was. And for, get that out of the way. Where is my dear Tams? Okay. Uh, I'm going to do the anthrax project just because it's huge. Uh, let's do quickly a look at the code families. All I do is pick graph code families from the reports menu and voila, it's ridiculous. It goes on for quite a while and you can see the structure and visualization of all the code families. What if wow. I want only some of these? Let's say this local one. How is the local connected, um, the local represented in this data? So like I said, I don't have to look at all my codes. I can just do local. And now just the local codes are showing here. That's 33 of my 158 codes. And now if I graph code family, I just get that one. Um, so that's that, but you know, you can do a lot of visualization from one of these result windows. So here is these result windows are basically an index into all the codes that I've created. And you can see a bunch of these reports have graph attached to it. So I can graph the relationship between any two columns. Let's say I want authors, to uh, codes about fear. We're going to do that. I'm going to select codes and say, just show me the ones about fear. And now give me a report which graphs uh, data. And I want you to pick the author and the code. And I can make all sorts of things here. I'm going to do variable weight line. I'm going to scale weight lines. I want to include counts. Show me the graph. And there you see all the authors of articles in a very ugly sort of way connected to how they used fear. Now, there's a little trick here. There's something called attributes in GraphViz, and I can switch the direction, which if nothing else will help a little bit. It's called rank direction. This is not my program. It was created by AT&T, but now I've switched it to left to right, and you can see somewhat better visualization here of how authors connected to specific codes. And the thing about these graph uh, visualizations is I think that they're a little bit better um, when you have less data because you can just see how messy it gets in here mm -hmm. with all of these things. And GraphVis has a lot of options that are well beyond my sort of skill set even. Um, but it's a data representation language. Yes, yes that's an awesome visualization, which I think uh, uh, no other software uh, does that. And there is one question which has come up uh, with reference to this one. Can the entire uh, visualization that you have showed us, can oh, be yeah. printed out or exported? Oh, yeah, totally. Let me show you that. So I want to can I do it like a really crazy graph? Uh, graph co-occurrences. I don't, I have to even actually look. Group 
on same file only. No, I want to connect all my files and I want uh, to include the codes and the file names, track on uh, city. Let's see what this does. I have no idea. It's going to be wacky. It's going to be huge. It's generating thousands and thousands of lines and connections as we do this. Uh, Co-occurrence is when do uh, records share some single element between each other. And since I've got thousands and thousands of records of data here, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to take a minute or two. But you'll see that I'll be able to save it as a JPEG. I'll be able to save it as a text file that I could then look at. And the text files are actually pretty readable. Like it says like this arrow that. And like that is how uh, graph is does things. I'm burning out poor Graphis's memories with my project. Um, uh, as soon as it, as it comes up, I will show it. It's working hard. But yes, you just go to the file menu of Graphis and you can save it as a PDF, a JPEG, GIF, uh, any, any GIF, I guess, uh, any file format. Uh, TAM stuff itself, the codebook can be exported in a standard called the QDA REFI standard. The data can't, but um, I'll show you the data export if uh, TAMS ever comes back home to me. Let me just crash it and do a smaller, less wacky project than what I did. It may melt down my computer otherwise. Let's just do something simple. Search. Let's just take one uh, set of codes. Uh, public health, of health. Show me the relationship between all, both cities and public health. So I'm going to do the report, graph my data, my city code, and uh, the code code, and define, I don't care about anything else. There is um, only one of my cities had public health codes. And if I come here, I can export it. And I just want to show you all the file formats it can export. Wow. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, my data, wouldn't it be nice to get my data out of here? So I have an export data, I pick which columns I want to export, and I can even rearrange the columns here, uh, click on different ones, uh, say do I want um, the extra, remember padding, that's that extra slider stuff, do I want it tab separated, comma separated, return separated, XML or other? So I could um, fill in my own between rows and between columns and you can get the data out that way. Well, Mr. Matthew, I really must say your um, software is amazing. It's mind blowing. Thank you. And you've been highly generous to keep it open sourced. Uh, but there is so much to learn and uh, i think we uh, there probably is a manual online that we can go step by step oh by. yes oh absolutely so i'm just going to pull up the website just so that you can see it okay. thank you asha maybe others also can um start that's okay, sir. You are muted right now. Can you please unmute yourself, yeah. sir? Is that better? Thank you. Yeah. So I uh, hope you can see my the TAMS website. There's docs here on the left side. You can see there's the general tutorials primary documentations, including the updates for each of the versions, 
And then help with specific issues. And I'm just gonna pull up one because I've tried to make them very accessible. Uh, here's how to work with PDF files. I'm just gonna open it in a new window. It's gonna take a second because it's a fairly large file. And you can see I have created these as kind of comic books that point out how to do different things. Okay. And then there's also a video resource page here at the top. And you can see there's a guided tour, a guide to the result windows. And then there's a sequence of videos on analyzing code frequencies, like a code frequencies, co-coding, like analyzing when do codes overlap, two videos on analyzing co-occurrence, when do codes share some other element, uh, and then uh, two uh, videos on the data comparison tables. That's brilliant, and I love the comics. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's the uh, very easy way to learn. You know, when something is in cartoon or the comic form, it really becomes easier to learn. Yeah, yeah and I can point to things, right? Like, it would be tedious that to constantly, you know, not have like the image right there and say, that's what you click on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, sir, one more question. Um, since uh, I see that TAMS is a user friendly and the aim of yours that it should reach to maximum number of um, individuals to go ahead with the research work. Now, my question to you is, um, how friendly is the tool with other languages? Or is it strictly English? Ah, great question. And the answer is, I'm still figuring that out because I'm using Apple's system. Okay. Um, and so, for example, um, obviously it's, it works well with kind of most Latin-based languages. Mm -hmm. um, it ran into problems recently with someone who was using Catalan, which is a language in, from Spain, but not Spanish. Uh, right. And it turns out we had to fiddle with some things to get it to work. I know someone has been using it in Chinese. Uh, That's right, sir. Uh, I know that uh, people have asked about Arabic, and Arabic is such, it's such a fascinating and interesting language, and I don't know. I mean, I, I don't speak Arabic. Um, and so I'm hoping that they will reach out to me and we'll figure out how to make it work. Yeah, because, you know, you have said that TAMS is a markup language and that's what I was trying to associate myself with R, you know, yeah. there also you have markup, completely markup is there also. So I will, that's the reason why I asked you because one of the project which R is coming in is becoming a multi-language, you know, user-friendly tool. Mm -hmm. That our studio. Yeah. So that's the reason why I wanted to ask you since TAMS Analyzer again is working on the similar kind of a philosophy which is free and open source and you're giving it and it is so user friendly. It is not very uh, complicated like other uh, softwares that I can see in the qualitative domain basically. So, you know, that's the reason why I wanted to ask you how friendly is it when it comes to the language, you know, uh, because yeah. transcription, narratives, discourse analysis, uh, yeah. this, uh, uh, you know, all these things, narratives, you know, are focusing on the language and the interpretations. The real philosophy of looking at it, you know, interpretation is what uh, I am trying to find out in this. Coding, absolutely fabulous. The way you have come up with the visualization is also awesome and you are very close to um i should say if i'm able to see my uh, concept development building of the concept as well as the modeling concepts are also there i can see how well you have shown how to develop from coding to your own model also so yeah. i think maybe a little bit more of work and we would be able to come up with mixed methodology also yeah I don't well, see it to be very far off from that. Uh, probably not. I just don't do it. So I, you know, like I would need, I, I have to say that I, I'm not sharing. Hold on a second. Let me bring up. I just want to show you something wacky about okay. TAMS. So TAMS just, you know, people contact me 
graduate students as they're finishing their dissertations and say, I need this report. Notice that there are two co-occurrence here. So that's because two different graduate students reached out to me yes. and said, I need to do this with my data. And I was like, mm -hmm. I can do it. Okay. And that's how TAMS has grown. Um, it, it's really driven by people's needs and them choosing to work with me. I'm literally looking forward um, TAMS analyzer to be present even on Windows so that it reaches to maximum number of people. So, I know. I, I know. wish you good luck for that. And, I just uh, don't own a Windows machine. <laughs> yes, that's right. Absolutely right. I can't mm -hmm. think about that right now. Um, and secondly, you wanted to show us an uh, image you have shown me, video analysis. That's a perfect way that you have shown me that yes. Okay, huh. one more question that I wanted to ask you is, um, you know, when you are talking about the video analysis, is there any limitation with the size of the video that we are going to import it into TAMS analyzer or you're giving it? Um, <sighs> well, like okay, I'll just say this. Um, remember that for single user, that means if it's just a project on your desktop, probably not. It's really gonna depend on the RAM of your machine. It's just okay. going to depend on the memory of your machine. Um, Apple's codecs, as they're called, sort of the operating system's ability to deal with video, very large size files. It'll be slow in part, just because things are going to be loading and unloading and switching. And that may be a little bit painful. And same goes with the audio files also, I think. Absolutely. So, it, from Tam's point of view, there's no difference between audio and video files. It's all handled through Apple's multimedia front. It, it, it doesn't even know whether it's an audio or a visual file per se. Right, so, and what about uh, transcription? Now we have to uh, uh, complete the transcription process and then come over to TAMS analyzer or I can directly do the transcription within the system also. It depends on what you mean by transcription. Uh, I, you know, I'm old, I'm old, I'm very old. So <laughs> to me, transcription means I listen to something and I type what they're saying. Yes. These days, most people being, I send it to Otter AI and it comes back as a giant. That's tech right. Call. That's what I was looking for because if you are telling me that, yes, I can import Word files, which means Word also has the transcription uh, facility for the users to do it on the go. So, you know, if I'm importing, that's the reason why I'm connecting and I'm asking you that question. Um, so, so that, you know, it becomes uh, uh, much more easier for us to do everything in one system rather than moving from yeah. here to there. I think, I think you're going to find you're going to have to move between systems. That is, you're going to do the transcription elsewhere, import it into TAMS, that's fine. The trick is going to be that you might have to fiddle around a little bit and maybe even learn this very complex thing that's built into TAMS called regular expressions, which is a way of describing patterns of letters and characters mm -hmm. and saying, search for this pattern and surround it by the time code. So it knows that that zero, zero, colon, zero, zero, colon, zero, zero, colon, dash, something or other is a time. Make it a time code. So it's it, it will kind of involve that kind of um, massaging uh, to get TAMS to link your audio file to the transcript that you've created. Okay, now one more uh, quick question to you, sir. Uh, coming back to the traditional quantitative methodologies, mm -hmm. okay, like um, ethnographic. Now you told us you used right at the beginning. Um, the word was uh, ethno-net methodology. That's yeah, so I would say that like, the that was something... of, it, it's, you know, I, I'm close friends with several people who do ethno-methodology, where they, they'll take maybe two, a minute or even less, 15 seconds of a conversation and analyze it down to almost the microsecond of when did this person pause and when did this person speak up and how did they gesture in a particular way 
And that kind of concurrent microanalysis of things, I don't think TAMS can really handle. And I've never met an ethnomethodologist that actually uses software like this to do their work because there it's it's so focused on like fraction of a second by fraction of a second by fraction yeah. of a second looking at things this is much more uh, segment coding and analysis is what people often refer to this i mean i have to admit i was kind of taught spradley's methodologies way back in the day symbolic interactionism and this is perfect for symbolic interactionism um your your sort of or uh, the, the anthropologist Johannes Fabian, a fantastic uh, anthropologist, um, uh, refers to it. What is it called? Post mortem data. It's post mortem data analysis and and organizing or something or other. He has this like marvelous phrase to describe that. Like you kill you kill the interview by transcribing it, and then like chop it up a thousand different ways. It feels very much like what a lot of qualitative research is yes absolutely um you know uh, first of all i need to thank you and uh, you know you have shown us given me the introduction to tams analyzer um in such a um i would say a nice way lucid way that you know we are able to understand you know what is the importance of that particular and as i can see some of the participants um, you know, looking forward for the Windows compatible software. And I think uh, <laughs> uh, maybe from our side, you are going to get a lot of wishes so that we can see it as soon as possible. And in the meantime, definitely, yes, I can um, see uh, a lot of scope for learning about that particular uh, analyzer from you directly rather than through videos or those tutorials that you have shared with us, you know, those intricacies, maybe it has to come through you, um, you know, and yeah. uh, definitely yes, some of us would be approaching you again, sir, for Please the, do. Please do. Uh, Dr. Sharma, do you want me to send you my, my slides? Yes. Please. Okay. I, will, I, will I can totally share it with the entire uh, participant group which is there and uh, they might love to do it because you see sir, most of them are coming from um, the area where I find that textual analysis is the best way to uh, you know start off of um, qualitative research you know yeah. and why not a, a analyzer like this one which is absolutely uh, you know neater way and to uh, you know analyze of this exercise in the beginning itself so I think I really have to thank you for that. And I really appreciate uh, sir, giving us some of your valuable time to us on this day. And without um, saying anything, you know, you immediately said, yes, I would love to take this session. And I would be inviting you once again. I have to say, I was just at a conference uh, on kind of social justice and science education. And we had a panel member from India. And I oh, feel like me waking up at 5.30 in the morning is small karma for her waking up at like 3.30 in the morning to participate in our panel. So with the 12 and a half hour time difference, I yes, felt like I, I needed to return the favor. Yes, that's right, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. And I will get back to you for more information and for the learning scope also from you, sir. All Thank right. you. Thank you and take care, sir. Bye okay. bye, sir. Bye. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, all of you again. Um, I mean, this had been another session where we saw a very simple software, um, you know, like um, Tams Analyzer. And you have seen what he has shown to you the kind of mind mapping. Uh, which you will be finding it out and I hope so um, you must have seen that it is not colored it's a very uh, publishing kind um, friendly so that you know you can simply download and there you are it is there with you and uh, since it was a very short kind of a session from his side uh, if you will see the way he is coding now, um, uh, you know, whether it is max QDA because he said it is 78% of um, mapping that has been done over there. And trust me, um, I don't see many of the individuals 
you know, understanding the importance of coding, whether it is in Max QDH or in NVivo, and he himself commented something about that um, tool also. However, uh, some of you who have got the access to MacBooks, number one, or iPhones, or, you know, if you can go to journalism and mass communication departments um, in your library or uh, in the university, you will see that they work only on MacBooks. And that's why I said that we also have the access to it. And, you know, you can really uh, sit and uh, understand as to how they are um you know entering and he showed us uh, if you will see the entire list of the uh things which were connected or associated with coding also though none of us have asked and he did not enter because he knew if he enters into that zone he is caught and it would be very difficult for him to move ahead so you know he just wanted to give us the introduction about tams and he himself was surprised um, when i invited him I said, okay, and uh, being uh, from Stanford, I can understand uh, why he has created uh, that kind of a tool and what will be the importance of it. So maybe some of you uh, who are interested, uh, you know, can definitely go ahead, have a look at this video once again and see the tutorials or the videos in depth for yourself to understand, uh, you know, uh, when you are talking about interviews, uh, especially I don't remember who is the person who asked me uh, the question whether we would be entering. Now, once you come back from the field and you are entering the entire um, interview into, uh, the, you remember he has said, mine is mostly more focusing on structured and unstructured. Now, I understood immediately because in interviews also we have got these three varieties of it and why he, he is pointing it out towards the uh, structuralized uh, coding or unstructuralized one or maybe even semi-structuralism. It missed out of my mind. I should have asked him that question also. And secondly, if he's telling to you that, yes, this is going to be a uh, user friendly. So let's try it out. And uh, there's nothing wrong. Apurva, she is there. Uh, some of us have already given you that, yes, if you are visiting your university, uh, find it out, especially in journalism and mass communication departments. If you have that department, um, you know, they have a huge, uh, because they have to keep on um, doing the editing work or even uh, directing or producing those documentaries and film. And that's why I know it very well that in my university, I have the MacBooks with me. So the, the desktop, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the Windows one, about the Mac, and then you can do that. So if you can lay your hands, I think uh, this tool is not so bad. You know, there are so many things that you can come up and you can uh, go ahead and take care about it also. Now, one more question maybe I have to ask him is handling big data. You see, PDF and Word, he made it very clear that, yes, it totally depends upon the RAM that is present in your own computer. So, you know, maybe that is the reason why he is uh, pointing it out uh, towards uh, going uh, the word files rather than this one. So I thank all of you for uh, being here for this particular session again taken by Dr. Matthews and it was wonderful and you have seen the way the passion he has towards his own software. Secondly, uh, tomorrow again Atlas TI team is coming up and they would be sharing me the number of the participants and since it is not on the Google Meet which is under my control Tomorrow it is in their control. So please be on time. Uh, I would suggest uh, maybe 15 minutes before the session starts. It's on Zoom. So they, I'll request them to um, allow you to enter that particular uh, software also so that all of us are on uh, time. And once they see, they are actually capturing the number of participants and then they would be issuing the uh, tomorrow again, Kanan sir, it's 8 to 10. I haven't changed. Uh, the change of the time is only on Friday uh, when the Buddhist, uh, you know, person is coming in. Otherwise, for all the sessions, the master class sessions, it is from 8 to 10 o'clock. So tomorrow again, kindly fill up uh, that particular uh, link I have given to you. Click on it and I want uh, tomorrow's session. I would be recording it, Kanika. Uh, recording cannot today also have recorded. 
and last time also i recorded it tomorrow also and even on 9th we would be present on go meeting uh, tomorrow asha it is 8 8 o'clock again there is no change in the timing at all for us so you would be there and kindly fill up those uh, uh click the link that i have given to you it will be taking you directly to the um form which has been generated by i'll just show it to you since all of you are here and if uh, they do not get the information about that person i don't think so or uh, they would allow later on and that is the reason why i'm asking all of you one second just give me a moment um here we go this is the one and they have given you this kind of link is there just click on this and you would be able to get all the information because uh, you know this is mine they never do it like that so i get the information from them okay so please go ahead complete it i'm not going to take much uh, valuable time of all of yours right now you can go ahead fill it up and submit it they will be telling me and leave a message kanika i had left already yes the link i have okay thank you somebody who has uh, shared it uh, it must be kanan sir only now this is the one thank you sir so this is what they would be giving it and you will have to go ahead and submit it this is mine so they have all the information submitted so that they are able to submit the information ma'am in the message that you have sent in the mail it says 9:30 eastern time 9:30 Eastern time, sir. That is for them, not for us. For us, nine thirty is eight o'clock. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, you. because they are working from America, so I have to share the American timing. So that was for them. Okay, for us, it is eight o'clock sharp. We would be there, sir. Okay, so I'll catch you up again tomorrow, and I hope uh, we will be able to uh, pull up. and start asking the question so that uh, you know what happens is that after 45 minutes or one hour they just uh, go away so you know the best is uh, start questioning them so many uh, questions that if you can put up i can read out and then you know we can utilize the entire two hour session that we can take it up you can ask them how to import maybe one question coming from one of you asking how to import the data the second person can ask you know show us how the data is being converted into code try to learn to question more and more kanan sir is there asha is there yasha i know and apurva uh, you know questions there are so many others are present and at least now i think uh, we have almost covered how many eight eight software till date so i think you should be able to come up cross question them uh, if this is happening what about in this you know so you are also in that learning sphere and you will be able to come to go also okay so i think i'm going to end till here only i'll catch you up again tomorrow in the evening if suparna is here suparna uh, after this session is that uh, as it was on mac i could so see whether the system is on the mac or on windows we have to see the concept the way they are moving now the question that i ask it has nothing to do i never tried the tams analyzer it is only from past one week that um, okay there is a way in which you can download it that also i am telling to you uh, on windows uh, there is a link maybe uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow please uh, tonight and tomorrow in the morning i'm slightly occupied with something there is a link is there you simply have to download it now if you have downloaded it whatever is being uh, functioning or operating on macbook i'm talking about you can do it even after downloading that particular uh, window I, i i i'm saying that i just give me a day or two i will give it to you because i do remember in last year when i was uh, writing a paper i wanted to know what all um, you know softwares were available for qualitative research and at that time i got introduced to tams analyzer so i wanted to lay my hands and i did it by that so you know there is that uh, particular link is there once you download that link and install it you know your windows works like a uh, macbook only and then you can uh, download this particular thing and you can work so just give me maybe a day 
or maybe early in the morning if i when i get up early in the morning uh, let me see if i'm able to uh, get that link and i will be sharing it with all of you so that immediately uh, after um, executing that particular link you can go ahead and you can download a tams analyzer and you can also start working on it. okay so i think in that way all of us are lucky i will show you how to do that also so as simple as that so i'll catch you up again tomorrow uh, i'll be there by 7:45 and i'll be interacting with them uh, because i have to take uh, at least uh, 35 user ids and that's why i'm asking you please go ahead and take care and working again at least um, i mean max qda i'll be getting it maybe a day because they are really working out whether uh, it has to be my id itself which is enough and all of you can work or uh, it will crash the system or they have to generate it or maybe they're generating it they'll be sharing it max qda one i'll be giving it then uh, secondly, even Atlas DI would be giving us for 15 days. So, you know, you also, uh, after learning tomorrow, each one of you, please put up those questions. How to export PDF? How to export Word file, Excel file, like day before yesterday, all of you were doing it. The similar way you do it tomorrow also, and I'm telling you, that is the way you will be catching hold of that trainer, and they would be able to share it and show it to you also, how to proceed further. Okay, so I think I'm going to end up with that. So thanks a lot. Good night. Take care and see you all tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye.